Welcome to LSE, to the first of a new series of urban age debates on cities in the 2020s. Um, this is hosted by LSE Cities, by the Alfred Herrhausen Gesellschaft, and by the LSE School of Public Policy. My name is Camilla Cavendish, and I'm going to be moderating a great panel um, who are speaking from various locations around the world, and we are being live streamed around the world. Um, as with all LSE public events, um, we do expect some tough questions, and um, I'll be opening up to Q&A a bit later. And please send your questions through the appropriate function on Zoom. Uh, the hashtag for the event is at Urban Age Debates, and we're going to speak for about 75 minutes and end at 2.15pm here in London. Um, but our speakers are obviously in Miami, Singapore and Berlin, and many of you listening in are coming from all sorts of other places where I hope um, you've managed to uh, either have some breakfast or some supper. So the urban age debates are exploring how cities are engaging with the profound global changes that have come about during the triple crises of the COVID pandemic, new demands for social justice and the climate emergency. So coming up in the other debates after this one, um, future events will include the Mayor of Paris, uh, leaders from Asian, Latin American and African cities, uh, the designers Thomas Heatherwick and Norman Foster, and the economists Mariana Mazzucato and Edward Glazer. Uh, but today we have a great panel who are going to discuss the dramatic shift that we've seen in working conditions in the pandemic, especially for knowledge workers. Um, you know, since the pandemic forced offices to close, many knowledge workers have got very used to working on Zoom with no commute, and some companies are welcoming a future where they may be able to tap into a more global talent pool uh, because geography has become less important. On the other hand, some individuals, and I would include myself in this, are desperate to get out of the house uh, and back into some real live interaction uh, with colleagues. So we're going to ask, what are those changes that we've seen in working conditions and what might that mean for the future of cities, because of course, plagues historically have been bad news for cities. I'm in London and the embankment here was actually built to provide the city with a modern sewage system after thousands of people died in the cholera pandemic of 1854. And after that time, you got Ebenezer Howard's concept of the garden city, which said, look, you can have greenery, you can have hygiene at the end of a railway line out in the suburbs. So one of the questions I want to ask is, which places are going to prosper as a result of this? And will it be suburbs or will cities have an enduring appeal? Um, on the panel, we have uh, Richard Florida, the urbanist, author and academic and professor. Uh, we have Aisha Kanna, artificial intelligence strategist who um, does a lot of work in Singapore and is, is running a very interesting entrepreneurial company that I hope we'll talk about. And we have Yanina Kugel, a business executive who's worked with Siemens among others. I'm gonna start with Professor Richard Florida. Richard, can you tell us a bit about what trends you were seeing in relation to knowledge work before the pandemic? And how do you think the pandemic is accelerating those or will, ex will influence those as we move forward? Well, I think the, the big trend um, going from the late 20th century, say about 1980 forward, is the rise of knowledge work. And, um, you know, whether you measure that by the percentage of people who hold an advanced degree or have advanced education or the people who work in occupations that are professional, knowledge, innovative or creative, you know, we see an enormous surge in that as we move from an older industrial economy where people work with their hands and their backs in the brawn to a newer knowledge economy where the mind has become the means of production. I think going back at least to that time, maybe earlier, there has been a shift towards telework, what used to be called telework, which is now called remote work or work from home. Uh, it, it, it grew in, in bits, you know, in, in cycles, but it never really got to more than a few percentage points of the population. Um, the pandemic coincided with the rise of, you know, fairly reliable uh, broadband and the rise of a whole series of new technologies of which I learned the name, like Zoom. In, in March of, of, of 2020, I learned the word Zoom. 
and the verb zoom, the noun ver zoom and the verb zoom. <laughs> and uh, at that point, you know, most knowledge workers then began to work from home. And, uh, you know, a, a huge percentage of knowledge workers, essential workers still had to go about their business and, and work in, with the public and work with others and were much more at risk for contagion of the, the disease, COVID. Uh, but knowledge workers got to work from home. And I think the best predictions that we have are roughly uh, before the pandemic, about 5% of knowledge workers in the advanced countries worked uh, remotely. And now 20%, although 40% of knowledge workers say, according to recent surveys, they would like to work from home. And I do think to be, to be quite candid, Camilla, I think the biggest change of this pandemic will not be in the geography of residence. I think there's been a lot of speculation. Mm. Will London decline? Will New York decline? Will San Francisco? We can go on and on. Will people yeah. move to the hinterlands? The big change will be in the geography of work. And that's something we can, we can talk more about it. So I do think this pandemic will be slightly different in that this, this pandemic will have an effect on accelerating changes in the geography of work. And just to put a, a quick exclamation point on that, I think the big threat, if you will, to cities will be in the central business district. You know, we have packed and stacked knowledge workers as a legacy of the industrial age. Like we packed and stacked factory workers in factories. We packed and stacked knowledge workers in these giant office towers and they endured long commutes by car and train and bus and what have you. I think that we could see some significant, they, they won't de 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 uh, be eclipsed, but we could see some significant decline in the demand for the central business district. And I think that will be one of the big, big challenges and opportunities coming out of the pandemic. That's very interesting. And, and what happens then to the service ecology around those office blocks in the central business district? You know, what happens to the cafes and the taxi drivers and all of that? Well, we actually have one very good research paper done on this uh, by the NBER, National Bureau of Economic Research, which has done spectacular work. I mean, I have these papers cataloged and there's literally hundreds, if not thousands of them produced on the COVID-19 crisis. There's one which focuses on this and it says th the biggest negative impact of the pandemic, uh, well, because remote, it's interesting. Knowledge workers, which means potential remote workers, are very highly concentrated in large center cities like London, New York, Singapore, San Francisco. They're, they're, that, that's where that kind of work, even though you can spread out, has been concentrated. Mm. So any impact on remote work, any shift of remote work outside of the central business district will impact that. So let's say in terms of demand for office space. The estimates are 20 to 30% reduction, even though workers will need more space. They're 20%, which is significant. But interestingly, this, this research paper suggests that the biggest impact of the reduced demand for central office space will be precisely on those service workers. So, so the essential service workers who are working in low wage precarious positions, working very hard to make life ends meet, working hard to support all of us during the pandemic, the biggest negative impact will be on their jobs and wages because those jobs and wages will be reduced dramatically as demand for restaurants, cafes, and so on that support service economy reduce. So quite terribly, uh, quite tragically, the biggest negative effect will not only be on the city fiscal situation, but mm -hmm. on the low wage contingent workers in those urban areas. That's interesting. Just one last question on this. I mean, do you think a lot of those workers, the, the essential workers, as you say, are probably themselves commuting long distances because of the kind of high rents that we've seen in central business districts. So, I mean, I'm just thinking if some of that ecology shifts outwards, is that actually gonna be a better deal for some of those people because it'll be closer to home? I, I think uh, twofold. Um, one, I think the biggest negative effect will be on increasing. I, I think it without um, strategic and intentional action on the part of national governments, provincial governments, and local governments, uh, there will be a terribly negative effect uh, in terms of increasing uh, work inequality. I think that's for sure. I do think with intentional action, um, some of the space in the central business district, and because of declining rents overall uh, for a short term, um, we would see some opportunity to provide affordable housing, convert office towers to housing and so forth. But if you think about the 2008 financial crisis, there was this brief moment when housing became slightly more affordable in large urban superstar cities, and then it surged up where, and you know, mm -hmm. look, the, ninth, the, the Spanish flu was followed by the roaring 20s. I, I think we could potentially look forward to a roaring 2020s. And if you just look at the most recent predictions by Goldman Sachs, discount how you like, they're predicting in the United States, in the United States, growth of seven and a half percent next year. 
Wow. The United States hasn't seen seven and a half percent growth in, I don't think in my lifetime. Yeah. So, so you could imagine a situation where despite all the prognostications of gloom and doom, there is a slight decay in, in rents in superstar cities, but they surge back upward. Maybe, maybe we won't see the oligarchs. You know, the oligarchs may have decided that they'd rather live in large estates in Monaco or Miami Beach or wherever. But, but we will see demand from professionals, from knowledge workers, from creatives and young people, uh, which, although it might not create demand for those super townhomes or those super penthouses, will still push up rents and make cities unaffordable for middle class working people and service workers. Great, that's very, very interesting. I'm, I'm going to turn to Aisha. I'm going to see if our other panelists agree. Um, I mean, Aisha, first of all, can I just say, you know, you're an entrepreneur. Do you feel that there are limitations to remote work? I mean, how much in the past has your company used remote work and how much have you needed to bring people together to create and to collaborate? Well, we, uh, the place where we really feel that we need to come together is when we're trying to build relationships of trust within the team or with our clients. So what we do is we build very large data platforms for large telcos and healthcare companies and government ministries. And um, so we have always been able to work remotely because our work is digital and data driven by nature. But definitely we felt that it was important for us to go in person and meet with our stakeholders. What changed with the pandemic was that we were able to see a mindset shift in our clients and within the teams over time, where we were beginning to get back to the level of productivity and of trust and of relationship building um, in a virtual setting. I certainly did not expect that, but that has been very interesting to watch. Apart from this, I think it has opened up to me, uh, and you know, I'm, I, I come, even though I'm in artificial intelligence, I've done a lot of work in human rights and women's rights, and for me, it's been very interesting how this has opened up our team to second, third tier cities in Indonesia and Pakistan, where we have hired really smart machine learning engineers, some of them women, mm -hmm. that we would not have found before or considered before because of the need for our teams to be physically present together sometimes. So I feel there is a... Uh, democratization of access to work as well that this has resulted in. I certainly have more access to talent. And um, because of this openness of our clients and organizations we're working for, and of my team itself to work with people in different countries, it has actually created more diversity and, and more out of the box thinking, uh, paradoxically in our firm. That's really interesting, because that's very much counter to what some people are saying, which is they find it really difficult to spark creativity digitally. And I mean, it sounds like you've actually found a way to empower people and, and continue to create. I mean, do you think that when the pandemic recedes, you're gonna want some physical space for interactions or will you not need that? You know, absolutely. I mean, I think there are two things. You have to look at the profile of my team. I'm the oldest by like decades in my team. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. They're really young. They are very at ease. They also very much understand, um, you know, their digital rights. And I'd love to talk about this later of, you know, that the pros and cons are just not, I'm not touchy feely with you. It's also, I'm observing you through voice, through video, through uh, breath sensors. Like, you know, there's so much more now that is a downside of using technology. But when you are working with young people whose average age is in their 20s, they are much more at ease. And they seem to slip into this more easily and use technological tools much more easily. Whereas I see that people who are older and especially not in the tech field struggle somewhat just because it's different. And I think that um, in general, with technology disruption, and this being one kind of disruption, we do have to continually adapt to new circumstances. So this has been a, a good lesson for all of us, that with uh, more automation, more digitalization, pandemic or no pandemic, we will have to adjust to different ways of working and upskill ourselves uh, to the new uh, demands of the 
you know, fourth industrial revolution. Yeah, well, that's quite an exciting prospectus. So thank you. Um, Yanina, can I come to you and ask about the big corporation perspective? So from your experience, I mean, how do you think um, corporations are going to try and get this balance between remote working and office working as we go into next year? I think everything that has said and when Richard said is like he learned the word, the noun, the verb Zoom. <laughs> we also have to remember that most of the things that we are used now are technologically possible already. And there were organizations already, and Aisha actually mentioned that, that were using that remote work, people, you know, traveling a lot, service people, people working in global teams. What I think really makes the trick is the culture of every organization. Because one of the things and, and what we experienced now over the last year is that everyone that was knowledge workers, right, that's um, the limitation that we're speaking about, we were all forced into an interaction like that. But then what happened in the very beginning is like that everything took place, like analog meetings took place. And then suddenly, you know, you realize that maybe it's more tiring than what Ayesha said is like you have people that are not used to it. There's a different learning. And so it's not only about whether it's technological possible, it's about to really see it's like, can we adapt to the entire different dynamics that digital collaboration and digital work action has to take place. So for example, do we miss social interaction? Yes, we do. I personally, and that's also most probably an age issue. I mean, do I believe that Zoom or whatever can replace social interactions? I don't think so. But what you could do is you could also start every meeting with a little bit of a social interactions like we did before we actually were going live with every one of you now. And when it comes to corporations, and it's very hard to say, the duration of the pandemic is only roughly a year. And I'm saying only because when it comes to change and cultural change, you actually need much more disruption. And we were also between us discussing that, for example, I'm living in Europe, it's total lockdown. Richard is currently in Florida. He can pretty much like still do whatever he wants to a certain simulation. So we also have different experience all around the world. When you think about large corporations, I still have met and spoken to managers that are still in that mode of thinking that they wanna control their employees. So, and sometimes I'm having the discussion, I said, I mean, even if you were present in the same office, what did you do? Were you standing behind 10 computers of your people and thinking what they were doing and watching them and controlling them? But that feeling, I wanna see my people, I wanna see what they're doing is still there. Mm -hmm. I even know from companies where there were requests out to measure the IT utilization. Okay, how many people were online? How many emails were floating? Was there a view or a shift of like IT traffic, data traffic that you could actually see? And when you take all of that into consideration, and then you have, of course, those organizations that were up for it, that were saying like, okay, we need to do some changes. So it all comes back to really sum it back. We are all human beings and virtual and digital Collaboration means we have to change the way that we behave and how we interact. And I think I see good signals, but I also do definitely see some very scary issues. And maybe last comment to that, I think what also happens is the inequality back home. I guess she was mentioning some of her teams being like in their early twenties. Maybe then the biggest thing that you're having as an issue is maybe that you don't see and you can't meet other people. But when you're on my age, okay, and you have children that are in homeschooling, I always call it the hashtag home everything. It's kind of like you're getting nuts by everything that happens in the same room as you also said at the beginning. So we also have to take into consideration to definitely balance out who's who, what are pretty much the backgrounds of everyone else. And then you have those, let's assume everyone's staying home. We're still in a luxury position. Our house is big enough, but there is a lot of families that are living all around the globe that don't have a lot of space. And usually it's not so important because people usually only sleep home. Well, when suddenly the entire family has to stay and do everything in the small place that they're living in, it causes different facts. Now, are corporates ready for that already? Not yet. And so I think that will really be something that we have to attack over the next month to come. 
Yeah, that's very, very interesting. And of course, I'm, I'm sure we've all experienced, as I have recently, working with teams of people largely in their 20s who are also living in really small accommodation, often sharing the kitchen table with somebody who's kind of leaning into your screen. And actually, um, it's, it's, it's very tough. And I agree that I'm homeschooling two kids downstairs at the moment. And, you know, I would quite like to get out. But I, I think um, if you're in your 20s, it can can be even worse. Can I ask you one more question, actually, Nina, about women in particular? Um, I mean, this crisis has put a burden on working mothers in particular, it seems to me. I was really struck that Aisha was actually saying that her company is creating new opportunities for women at the same time. But how do you see that, Yanina, in, in the big corporate world? I mean, I think it's like we have to look at the, at the broad numbers and for just a quick second, we also have to think about like those that are not knowledge workers. That pandemic has been overly dramatic, having a negative impact on women. They were mostly losing their jobs first, um, you know, in, in some of the areas that they were there. And then if they didn't lose their jobs, then they were actually coming to shortage of work times, which is another thing. And then let's go to those knowledge workers that theoretically could continue their work. What I saw was a trend of women due to the amount that they actually had to do back home, you know, because overproportionately they were taking a larger stage in doing the care work. Okay, so whether it's children or whether it's a household or whether it's elderly people, everything, there is hardly any country, the best is still Sweden, you know, where there is a balance of care work between, you know, men and women in a, in a heterosexual um, family situation. Mm -hmm. But due to the fact I also saw a lot of women and my pledge was always to companies not to reduce the working hours and let women, you know, just like also like cover up for the balance of like saying is like we know that you have a lot to do maybe you cannot work like eight or ten hours but we will just like also take our responsibility in that and i think this is the dramatic signal that we've seen and i haven't seen any state that for all of the things that they were launching in terms of like financial aid that had a gender balancing in their packages mm -hmm. in their financial aid packages in their welfare packages but i think that definitely needs to come because what we could see What's the disbalance in society that we know? Yeah, that's that's a very striking point. Um, there's so many different different things to talk about here. I mean, I wonder, just first of all, if we just talk a little bit more about work um, and and what you think the priorities will be of employees after the pandemic as they come back to whatever the new normal is i mean you know will will it be about health i mean richard i think you you suggested that will be people maybe more spaced out i mean will it be about interaction it, will it be this roaring 2020s when everyone's just going to want to party i mean richard what, what do you think the priorities will be well I, I think for the past 30 or 40 years we've seen a revolution in knowledge work in in, in the mind becoming the means of production and I think the big thing is we don't have any support structures. I think Aisha and Yanina said this so powerfully. We don't have any support structures around that. So we're just downloading more responsibility on the ind highly individualized and atomized knowledge workers, e even to the point of forcing them to set up their own technological infrastructure in their home, provide home care, uh, provide education to their children. And I think we're going to see bigger divides by geography. I think gender, you're 100% right by demography, by age, as well as by race and by, by class. Uh, coming out of this, I, I think work is going to be different. Um, some advantage group of people, uh, and, and I think this is mostly the 1%, uh, can work remotely and have a wonderful support staff in the office and out of the office. The 20 or 30% of us who do knowledge work will be able to navigate this. We'll be able to set up the technology, provide the support staff at home, uh, but, you know, there'll be 66% of the workforce that falls further and further behind. And uh, with, without real strategic and intentional action, those divides are going to widen. You know, we may see a boom, an economic boom, but just like the pandemic, the beneficiaries of the boom have been the 1% and then the advantage third, 25th to the third. Everyone else has fallen further behind. That will continue. I think one other thing that's just worth mentioning uh, I think there's been far too much uh, conversation about the decline of big urban centers. Uh, you know, London, New York, Berlin, I could go on, have survived far worse than this and have come back. I, I think it's smaller places. You mentioned at the outset suburbs. 
traditional generic suburbs, not wonderful rural places with coastlines and mountaintops where people can connect from and want to live. I think the generic places, smaller places will be hit a lot harder than people think. And that both large cities and small places with special amenity, there will be a, an enormous premium for amenity. Uh, people in choosing where to live and work will say, I can choose to live and work in a place with a lot of urban amenity, or I can choose to live and work with a place with a lot of natural amenity and there'll be premium. But I'm very nervous about these divides across the span of demographic, gender, race, and class issues widening uh, exponentially and astronomically as we come out of this crisis. Yeah, and so back to what you said earlier about the Central Business District, then it sounds as though you think the big cities with amenity will survive and some of the rents in the center may drop and actually that will also suck out from the suburbs, presumably. So the suburbs are left kind of stuck in a slightly unattractive place. Yeah, I think, I think Mayor Hildago in, in Paris has been very prescient with this, seeing the refashioning of the city or metropolitan area less as a place which separates work and home into specialized areas. And you know whether you like Moreno's notion of a 15 minute neighborhood, I, I like to think of it as a complete community, a community where you can live, work, send your kids to school and everything can be done in a somewhat more circumscribed radius. I think that affluent cities will move more towards that model. Um, there will be more ability. And I think in terms of the distribution of work, you'll see a redistribution. You'll see some of the work that used to be done in the central business district move out. Um, whether that will be private office or co-working space or neighborhood third places, who knows, but there will be enormous opportunity to decentralize the places of work closer to where the people, where people live. And I do think certain suburban and rural areas that are linked by transit or are quite lovely or, or quite demanded, they will become much more integrated, complete communities or 15 minute neighborhoods. So we'll see some kind of rebound. The good thing of that is that could reduce commuting, that could reduce energy use, that could reduce pollutants. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, that could be a net positive. Right, there's a, there's, that's fascinating. There's a lot in here. I mean, Aisha, do you want to respond to any of those points? I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm interested in your views on both the kind of what employees want are going to want and, and what impact that's going to have on the geography of all this. I think it's really interesting that we have been talking about remote work in context of, um, you know, the pandemic and the fact that who will benefit from remote work and who won't. But really, the bigger picture is automation. So what is really going to move the needle for workers, regardless of whether we're on Zoom or not, their need to upscale, they need to move away because all their jobs are going to get automated. We have Uber drivers delivering food that when you have self-driving cars or taxis, that's gonna go away. They're still going to need to have, find a way to enter this knowledge economy. And if anything, this may have you know, been the nudge, uh, unfortunately, that, that many people needed to start that adaptation journey. Now in Singapore and, and in some other countries, there's been a very, you know, it's always long-term planning and there has been a very systematic effort to upscale people, to subsidize them. So even while they, they, have, they get on the job training and subsidies from the government, uh, it's a small country, we can afford to do that and make sure that we take everyone along this path. But this requires a great effort and, and policy by the government to actually help those people who will be, whose tasks will be automated to find new ways of finding their own place in the digital economy. I think that's the bigger picture. Yep. And that means that whether we can meet in person or not, we're still pretty much going to be in increasingly digital environments. Um, and the environment will look very different. If you look at Facebook at work, it was such a boohoo, you know, look, they bought Oculus, nothing ever came out of it, poor things. But actually, VR is really coming into its own slowly. With Facebook at work, when you put on the VR, you're not in some cartoonish space. The idea is that you're much more seeing, just like we're seeing each other. And because of haptic technology, I could shake your hand if I'm wearing that glove. And because of haptic sensors, I can hear you from my right or my left, creating a much more authentic experience. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly don't think it replaces human interaction, but for those who are 
uh, you know, in, in locations. I, I think we need to, you know, we need to remove the elitism of location if, if we want to be more inclusive. And these technologies do provide a way for us to do that. So I think that we will see more of it. Now, one can never talk about technology or data or AI without the word governance in the same sentence, because one without the other is ridiculous. What I fear, even though, even though I build those machine learning models, is uh, what are we doing when we're, this, this webinar is being recorded? What are you gonna do with this? Where are you gonna put it? Are you listening to the way I'm breathing? Are you watching the nerves and the blood vessels in my face? Um, I'm sure LSE isn't, but maybe it is. Where, <laughs> where is that agreement? And this is the kind of stuff we need to pay attention to. Mm. Amazon now has an app called Halo. You can download it. It analyzes 18 features of your voice, your tone, your pitch, your volume. And it tells you whether you're in a good mood or you're feeling low energy or high energy. And now if Alexa is listening, it knows what to sell you. Or maybe your boss knows whether you're happy or not, which is terrible, you know? I mean, it's so intrusive. And this can happen in a physical or virtual or hybrid environment. In my opinion, these are the conversations we need to have because the train has left the station, it ain't going back. Um, and I think it's kind of not really about New York and London. I totally agree with Richard. Those cities are amazing. They're not going anywhere, but our and work environment is getting a lot bigger, a lot more complex. Yeah, I mean, that, that there's a lot of very useful thoughts in there and, and actually goes back to something that Yanina said about the fact that, you know, we had the bosses standing around five computers away and thinking they were controlling people and actually really not having a clue. And what you're saying is we can find out, you know, you don't have to be standing on the same, in the same room to find out a, a vast amount and probably too much about people. Um, Yanina, do you want to pick up any of those points? I mean, there, there's a lot of them. Yes, and I think it's like, you know, the comments that we had and also some of the questions that I at least was like slipping through in the in the chat is we have the tendency to always like think, you know, very much in silos and not really combining. I mean, so for example, what's the challenge of like um, what Richard said is like urban city centers and then remote places and small villages. And I actually making that comment of like, she would actually find talent that she hadn't found before because suddenly they were available and it didn't really matter anymore whether they were close. I think you have to take all of that together and then take the advancement of technology to say is like, if we feel that we're missing the social interactions, would there be a moment where we're taking all of that that people can feel which move we are, even though we only see on a screen, would that actually be helpful or wouldn't it? And on top of that, human beings, we do not all want the same. We are living in different conditions. We are different, you know, in terms of like what we like and taking all of that into consideration. Now, having said that, most governments and most organizations always try to have that one fit all approach. I do not believe that we will ever work remotely forever and forever and not all of us. But I definitely hope, you know, with the reduction maybe of office space that Richard said in his very first statement, we will come to a combination of more flexibility. Sometimes there is moments that you come together and sometimes it's absolutely not necessary. And we know that. And then with the advancement of like also learning different didactics, um, didactics of, of um, virtual collaboration, we could make use of it. And I think that is what I would like to see more that we have those combinations of technology of advancement of like what we know plus everything that we also have known from the past. We don't speak about it anymore, but reskilling and upskilling, the gap that we see in the workforce, automation, digitization will not disappear. It's only that for the last 10 months, we haven't been speaking about it. But now it will also be the time to invest exactly in the upskilling and the reskilling of people that lost their jobs. I mean, you could see the latest report now with the closing of the end, how many people have lost their jobs. Have you seen any government saying it's like, okay, that job is lost. Maybe they will never recover and will never go back. Are we starting to retrain people for others where we know we have a gap of skilled workers? Now, I don't want to blame governments, 
but at least coming up with a strategic plan on how to move there is something that I have hardly seen. And the same also matters for organizations because the, the gap for skilled workers has been a gap already and will remain a gap. So we will have to retrain people, not even having mentioned the social impact, right? If there is a much bigger divide, we will always, I mean, we will also result in a situation that I don't think would be acceptable for many societies. Yeah. Yes, so, so a conversation that began about work and cities is, is morphing into a very important conversation about skills and education. And um, Aisha, I mean, I know you sit on Singapore's technology board and, and you mentioned some of what they're doing. Could you tell us a bit more about Singapore's, I think it's the Skills Future Program, isn't it? I mean, it's a, it's a very, very ambitious program. What kind of skills is Singapore trying to bring to its population? Yeah, so the Skills Future Program, I was on the committee that, um, the steering committee that led to that. And, you know, they, within a year, they went, they came up with a plan to have more integration between industry and academia so that the, uh, so that we could move towards innovation in new industries like biotech, food tech, agri-tech, robotics, uh, you know, all of the industries that we associate with the fourth industrial revolution much more quickly. And that education was just not theoretical, but was, uh, but in every program, there were apprenticeships, there was time spent as part of the curriculum with the different kinds of cutting edge businesses and companies. So the idea really is that before this, when somebody is hired, they hit the ground running. And that is the number one gap that most employers face when, and even we hire very talented students from graduate programs, but we always have to have these three, four months of training. And if Singapore as a country can produce graduates that already had an understanding about the business context of the theory that they've studied, whether it's mechanical engineering or biotech, it makes them all the more attractive to uh, different companies and makes them better entrepreneurs. That is one part of it. The other part of it obviously is that the Singapore government spends a lot of energy attracting some of and investing in some of the most cutting edge companies, inviting them to set up their headquarters here. The industries that we're interested in as a country are both those for which we see demand in the world, but also those that we need ourselves. The pandemic has shown us that we need to be more food resilient. We import all our food. And so we have this 30 by 30 that we want to be able to make 30% of, of our food by 2030. So we have some great startups that we're encouraging. We have programs in food tech that are coming up. Um, and I think that is really motivating some of the young people as well, because there is the pandemic has made us realize that to be resilient, not just economically successful, we need some of these new technologies. So it was very nicely timed, luckily, that the Skills Future had started a few years before, so we're already on that path. Yeah, and you know what, some of what you say, I mean, I, I really admire Singapore's approach to this because it has the long-term view, as you say, and it, it's very practical. And whenever I've met people in the Singapore government, they they have looked around the world and learned to other people from other people's mistakes, which a lot of Western governments, I, I feel, don't really do. Um, but in a way, what you're seeing, you know, it, it's a real failure on the part of our education system, to be honest, if we are churning out graduates who can't hit the ground running. I mean, that is a really shocking indictment of our education system in a way. And we should have done that a long time ago. I mean, you know, if, it, if it's about integrating business and academia more closely, that is, that is something that we should presumably have already done. And I, I wonder why we haven't done it. Come on. I mean, it's a remnant of the Industrial Revolution, right? They put them all in factory-like conditions so parents can work from nine to five. But, uh, and unfortunately now it falls on us, Camilla, and, um, and us mothers here and fathers here to, to make sure that while the education system catches up painfully slowly, we are introducing them to the basics of computational thinking. I, I think not coding, but understanding how machines work as a, yeah. just computational thinking, is as important as reading, writing, and doing math. 
It would be so ridiculous if our children went to school and they said, yeah, we're not going to teach them how to read. <laughs> it's, it's the same idea. 10 years from now, we, we would you know, never send our kids to such a school. Right. But what's interesting to me, and Singapore, like any other country, struggles with this, and Yanina pointed it out as well, it's not just about young people. I'm on the neighborhood watch, and you know, there, there are people of all ages, and we get together and we patrol the neighborhood. Um, and I get to talk to them, and some of them are in their 50s and they are late 40s, and they wonder, can they learn these new technologies? Where is their place? And um, they also struggle with the virtual work, even though they're knowledge workers in the traditional sense, they're project managers. And we haven't quite figured that out anywhere. I mean, Singapore's trying, other countries are trying as well. But that idea of how do we help those people adapt and find meaningful work in an age of increasing digitization and um, automation, that is the question that that I think about quite a bit. I think yeah, that's to, a very to build interesting on that, Camilla, um, yeah. I think what Aisha is saying about automation, AI, and education is something that we just need to highlight. Um, I think that we have a big disruption in work, but I think the even bigger disruption coming is to education. I, Aisha just pointed out that we have a legacy system from the industrial age. Um, let me give you three examples that I think might shed light on this. Um, one, because of this, we put our kids in a pod school with four other families. None of us wants to go back to regular school. Now, we're all advantaged. We all can afford. But when we look at the cost of education in an American context or a Canadian context, that pod school is delivering so much more of a bespoke education to our kids that no one wants to go back. And I'm hearing this conversation, not just among our four families, but amongst people who I thought were believers, true believers in the need for a traditional school environment. That's one. Number two, as a result of this pandemic, I bought myself a Peloton bike. What I learned on that Peloton bike is that all of the things I thought I needed to pay for in terms of personal training, I don't have to pay for. The instructor says to me, via my screen, I can deliver you personalized training with metrics at scale. That's what my Peloton instructor says to me. That's how, if, if you can deliver physical fitness and professionalized personal training at scale, which is a very hard thing to do. Yeah. You can deliver, and then finally, I taught my class on Zoom this summer as an MBA intensive. I brought in this group of people from all over the world. I received my highest instructor and in course ratings in the history of me teaching over four decades. Wow. And I said to my teaching assistants, I said to my teaching assistants, we can do this 10X. So instead of teaching one and two courses a year, we could easily do this 10 times. If I can deliver that course 10 times, I could probably actually deliver that course 20 times. What does that mean for the future of education? I think we are seeing, and Aisha, I'm sure knows much more about this than I do, the disruption potentially to education and the kinds of inequality for those with means versus those without means. Some people can't even have a computer in the home is going to be, I, I think the biggest legacy of this will be even more so than work, the beginnings of this disruption and creation of new educational models. Um, Yanina, do you want to comment on that? No, honestly, there is nothing to add um, because I think that is, you know, the question is always like, what's the result if the segregation of society will continue? Because I think when we, when we think also, you know, what's, what's else important? to life, right? It's a question of like, can you live in peace? Um, can you feed your family members and all of that, right? Let's for a moment, not only think about like working life, but think about everything else. Where would be the ideal situation to live? And if we then see the segregation in the world and if we would like build on what Richard very, very truly said is, would it actually increase the segregation of many of the existing societies? It would. And then what do we do for everyone else to actually manage to manage, um, you know, to, to, to mind the gap, to close the gap. That's the, I don't have a solution. If I had, you know, it would be brilliant to really bring it up. But I think there is ways to, to close that gap or to make it more narrow. If we do not start about again here, the schooling thing is also, does it always have to be a central approach? Or could it also be tailor-made depending on which community you're speaking of, right? Not everyone exactly needs the same thing. 
And for me, it seems a little bit like that in all of that thinking in digital age will foster and will, will challenge us more in having more flexibility in our decision-making and more flexibility in our thoughts. Because if you think at most of the decisions that we have been taking, be it at a university, in an organization, on a country level, on a state level, it has always been one decision for everyone. Yes. But it has not always been that that one decision was equally fair for everyone. But to have that flexibility, and especially in a democratic approach, you know, of a democracy, will become really challenging yeah. because most of the human behaviors is like always defending the past and not always exploring the future. Yeah, I mean, it strikes me that you're all talking about some shifts which are very potentially very empowering, very democratizing, very exciting for one particular group and for another group, really very scary. And, and I mean, Richard mentioned support networks, the lack of support networks, which, which are beginning to be exposed. And I just wondered if you all wanted to address that a bit more, you know, what from the different places that you sit, what kind of support networks do are we going to have to provide to help? Well, I think Richard thought it was the 60%. I mean, you know, the people who are going to find it very hard to adapt. I mean, Eric Schmidt always does the, that speech where he says, you know, I'm looking to hire people who can invent their own job. And half the audience is thinking, great, I'm at Stanford and I'm going to invent my own job. And the other half of the audience, you look at their faces and they're thinking, oh my God, I just want someone to give me a job and tell me what to do. So, so what do you all think about, you know, the kind of support we need in this, in this new flexible world? Well, I think we just need this. <laughs> we need phone. Okay, I, I have to tell you, I, I'm so excited by the disruption in education because it is going to let more people in than leave people out. Yeah. I have people, I have clients in Africa and in Indonesia. See, I'm literally dealing with emerging markets and they are so hungry for knowledge. Knowledge now that is free, that you don't have to randomly go to an, you know, get into an Ivy League university and have access to those courses. And they are doing it. My team members, people I know, I go nine eye, and they're like on Coursera taking courses. Um, so infrastructure, telecommunications infrastructure and mobile phones, the decreasing cost of computation on the phone and the decreasing cost of smartphones is going to revolutionize access to knowledge. Right, we yeah. don't need to give people money, we need to educate them. And that is why I come back to the same point. Um, you know, the only people who are at risk are those above a certain group, a uh, certain age, because the others, when you're even 30 or 40 or 50, um, and even, you know, 70s, if you're, it's okay if you're in that mode of learning and adaptability, you've never had more opportunity. Yep. If you think about Pakistan, 220 million people. Um, you know, average age is 22, the third largest freelance, digital freelancer market in the world. That's wow. unbelievable. If you look at the education level compared to other countries, where are they learning this? Certainly not in the schools and they're earning dollars. They're mm -hmm. going to platforms like Upwork. There's a marketplace out there for people. And um, you know, they're the same people. They have cars now, and they, or they have bicycles, they can afford fridges and TVs. This is, and they can have hope for their children. I see this every day. I don't see as much in Europe and in America like Richard and Yanina because I'm not there, but I do see the in incredible empowerment of the poorest, uh, but, but really awesome group of people that have not had access to this before. Yeah, for, first, first principles to build on that. I think there are three initials that we need to etch into our brains called UBI, mm -hmm. universal basic income. That what we are seeing now is an incredible socioeconomic disjuncture. If you look at the two major movements we've seen around the world today, the rise of populism or Trumpism and the Black Lives Matter movement, they, they are both in very different ways, a response to people being shut out of the future. Uh, folks, minorities, uh, less advantaged people saying, we're being shut out, we, we want opportunity. And, and for the populace, the, the white 
middle-aged male worker saying, uh, my future has been cut off too. So we need some new kind of social safety net. And I think that's something like a universal basic income, which provides some sort of seed capital or funding. And, and also not just money. I think Aisha so importantly said this, it has to be something which gives people purpose. And what's happened with education, it used to be that if you went to school, at the end of school, there was a job. If you went to the LSE or the University of Toronto or Harvard or Stanford, there was some sort of job. There's not necessarily a job at the end of that anymore. Even, even a professional job is not necessarily a guaranteed good life. Yeah. So I think we need to create mechanisms. And uh, you know, one of the things you see that the more affluent folks in society doing is saying, I'm gonna make sure my kids have enough money to do whatever they please. They don't have to go into the family business. They can work on civic problems. They can set up a philanthropy. They can work on social justice issues because I can provide that seed capital for them. I think we need to think long and hard about what a social safety net or social support system. And I think we start with a universal basic income hinged to giving people the support they need to find the kinds of work that gives them purpose and meaning in their life. If we don't do that, if we don't provide some kind of social safety net for this new age, uh, there will be hell to pay. I, I think what we've seen in terms of the backlash on both the left and the right will grow and grow. Yeah, I mean, the, the universal basic income concept, as you know, is um, I guess some people are concerned that you lose that, that exactly what you lose the sense of purpose of work because you end up paying people not to work. And so while I'm, I'm with you halfway, I'm worried that you would end up you know, you would end up accepting automation and, and giving people just enough to get by and losing that sense of purpose. And you have to hinge it to purposeful work. You can't just hand people money because, I mean, look, people have to cover their material needs. That's base one. But in order to live a fulfilling and decent life, people have to have purpose. So that some kind of social support or UBI-like mechanism has to be hinged to finding people's purpose, whether that is neighborhood and community work, whether that's having a startup, whatever that is. But I, Camille, you're 100% right. We just can't go into a kind of Kurt Vonnegut world yeah. where people have no purpose and meaning and just... And, and we found, one of the things we found is that people can't fill themselves up by consuming. Right. We, we know that now about the advanced world. Consuming more doesn't make your life better. So finding purpose and meaning is important for everyone. It, it, maybe if I it, jump in there, I mean, Finland has been running a trial on the UBI, right? And for those of you that are interested, I think it's interesting to actually see that there were some people taking the time to do something else, you know, explore new businesses and other so now that obviously is at the heart of social security Europe, which a lot of Western European countries have, and it doesn't apply for all of the other markets. But I think there is one very important thing is like, and, and I'm happy to hear you, Aisha, being so, um, so positive and like all of the opportunities. I unfortunately always also see 80% of the people in the world and sometimes even more are not knowledge workers. And for them, that time and that future doesn't really look as brilliant. And if you, for example, see a lot of countries have been um, have been pushing equipment out to pupils, right? At least that they could attend the digital classes if they happen at all. And we see that they're not capable of using them. They don't have um, um, wireless access back home. So you actually see that the infrastructure doesn't really work like that. And I think the very important topic here is purpose and the meaning of purpose, I think is a different one for everyone. Academic, academic rates are not going to be the solution for having a social welfare all over the world. And not everyone will be you know, either driven nor will he or she be possessed with the capabilities to actually go that way. And I think that is the question that we sometimes have to watch out that the discussions that we're having, and I know that this event is about knowledge workers, but it doesn't really become the bubble discussion where those that are having a privilege, and here I think it's very important to understand, Privilege is not only the question whether you're white or black or whatever. Privilege is the question also. Do you have access to education? Do you have access to the minimum education at all? Because if you don't have that, you cannot explore and you cannot use, um, you know, for example, the fluid like Richard is teaching everywhere, right? 20 classes for free, which of course would be a liberty, what Aisha also said, but you need to have the minimum standard. And I think that is the world that we have to cover and that we have to see that we're not making a bigger disperse. Very good point. Now, there's a lot of very good questions um, I can see coming up. I'm gonna break for questions in a minute. Just before I do, 
um, I wanted to give each of the panel a chance to just say what the key takeaways are for them so far, just quickly um, from this debate. Richard, what, what do you feel the key thing is you've heard today so far? Well, I think we're going through a huge disruption, which as you said at the outset, is an acceleration of already in place trends, a rapid acceleration. And I think what we're hearing is that when most people talk about changes in where we live, are, am I gonna live near a mountaintop? Am I gonna leave London or New York? Am I gonna live near a lakefront or small cities? That Those are important changes, but the bigger changes will be one in the way we work, that that is a fundamental one and one that's not receding and will accelerate, creating advantages for some, the privileged and disadvantages for others, creating a bigger divide. And then secondarily, I think our great insight has been that, that perhaps the even bigger shift looking out further because it's a, it's a smaller a, a piece to begin with, but it could be a bigger disruption, is to education and human development. That, that these technologies, that automation, that these trends may very much for the first time in say a couple of centuries, begin to erode and disrupt the model of education that we inherited for the industrial revolution. There's a bright side to that. There's a very bright gleaming side of that, especially for those who are advantaged. But there's a downside of that. If we don't take intentional and strategic action, many, many people can be left behind. Brilliant. Um, Aisha, quick takeaway from you. I think it's been interesting to think about cities. What I think is going to happen is that the large cities will still be very attractive um, and great places with high quality of life, but you will have little clusters of mini cities now uh, all over the world. And they will be ones in which people will be, uh, you know, interacting in, in doing virtual work. And they may not have great theater, but with virtual reality and others, they will enjoy that great theater. They may not have a great restaurants, but they'll have terraces in their apartments that are primed for drone delivery. And they may not have a fabulous gym nearby, but they'll have a Peloton like Richard and an AI trainer with Tono. And that is gonna be really interesting. Where will these mini cities come up, these mini clusters? And people will think their quality of life is just as good. Um, and this is what I found, that I now talk to people in Jakarta and Mumbai and Lahore, they don't want to move to New York and Paris. Even I'm shocked, I think I'm so old, I'm actually shocked because like, who doesn't want to? They're perfectly fine where they are, they're enjoying life where they are, and that is what we'll see more of. And I think that's a wonderful trend. It's, a, it's kind of a win-win. Yeah, and it's probably good for the global climate as well, let's hope. Um, you know <laughs> I think it's like bringing those different perspectives in there, right? I mean, climate. Um, different types of job, urbanization versus like the remote cities, everything that we spoke about, you know, types of different work and thinking about what would be the huge opportunity if we would take all of that thinking together in one approach. And then if I take, you know, that old sentence, I think education is, is, basic, is the basic for everyone. But we have to think about like education doesn't stop when you're 20 or yeah. in your early 20s, but education is a lifelong approach and we also have to come up with solutions to actually put all of that together. So. Great. Um, thank you very much and for a very rich discussion. Now I'm, I'm gonna take some of the questions. I mean, I think you can all see the questions too. Um, so I will pick some out, but feel free if there are any that particularly excite you to, to um, respond to those. And, um, one I thought was very interesting from Thomas Mendoza, um, he's saying, do you foresee any impact to salaries with the rise in remote working? A San Francisco employee is currently definitely more expensive than an employee, say, Nebraska or India. Um, who would like to answer that? I'll start. I think what we're seeing among the capitalist class, if I can use that word, is an attempt to radically alter the terms of work. I think it's on two fronts. I think there is a manipulation of remote work to say, um, we would like you to move from high paying places to low paying places, and we will pay you less. I mean, Facebook is on record and other companies are on record as saying, if you move to one of these less expensive places, we will pay you less. At the same time, in the United States, there is an incredible whipsawing of jurisdictions. 
there is a move now on the part of the right, the right wing part of the capitalist class to say to jurisdictions like San Francisco and New York that are progressive, that vote liberal or democratic, that pay, have higher minimum wages and better social safety nets, better social programs. Uh, if you don't cave into our demands, we are gonna to move to a low tax de destination like Miami or Austin in the states of Florida and Texas. And uh, this is what people don't see. They see this as, oh, the rise of the rest. It's a wonderful flourishing of places. In fact, it's elements of the business community saying to places, uh, we want uh, less taxes. We want less social programs. We want less regulations in places like San Francisco and New York. And if you don't abide by this, we will pick up and move ourselves and our companies to less tax, less regulated, less progressive jurisdictions. And this is something that, that is escape. It's for some reason escaping the view of most commentators on contemporary urban affairs. Hmm. Fascinating. Do either of the other two, do you want to answer that? Or shall I take another question? You know, I would agree with Richard. I mean, on the one hand, you know, the labor arbitrage advantage for digital work is real. Um, and uh, we, I certainly take advantage of it and so does everybody else. And that is very capitalist, but there, there's no, there's no, you know, it's not a fence mm -hmm. in that sense. Uh, but I think the bigger issue is that I have heard companies are doing exactly this. They're kind of trying to force people, their wages down, trying to tie it to location more than the value that they're 100%. bringing to the company. And that is demoralizing to people who are working hard. I think that's the problem. We need to uh, kind of decouple location uh, from the value and the hard work somebody's doing and give them that value. But will there be overall a depression in wages as more emerging markets come and are able to uh, you know, give the same skills at a lower price? That's a different trend and a different, um, Kind of uh, thing to think about, but but they're two different issues, and I think that they both need to be addressed. And we've seen this movie before. You know, let's let's call it for what it is: a race to the bottom, a race to the bottom. That's what we have unleashed at the local level now in in contemporary capitalism: a race to the bottom. And we saw what happened when this happened in the Industrial Revolution. Places like Pittsburgh, which were had labor organization and progressive government, or Detroit. Business moved en masse, relocated plant, auto industries, steel industries, moved them en masse to the suburbs, the Sunbelt and overseas to undercut those wages. This is a contemporary digital capitalism version of it. And what we're seeing around the world is this kind of a celebration, the rise of the rest, the rise of these communities, the movement and, and people cheering. I mean, it's so bizarre for me to hear people cheering the decline of San Francisco, cheering the decline of New York, cheering companies moving out, not anticipating the fact that a large part of this is a reduction in wages and working conditions and an erosion, an attempted erosion in regulation and the social safety net that in a place like the United States has been highly localized. So, so I'd just like to, that there's, a, there's a question that relates directly to this from Cristobal Diaz Martinez, um, who's actually saying, you know, is there a future for unions? Because clearly um, you've suggested, as she says, we're losing our agency as workers if we're just yep. adapting to these dynamics. So, so how do you radicalize democracy? And I suppose part of that is, you know, what is the role for unions? Or I would ask, what is the role for governments? Well, I think when it comes to unions, I mean, they have been thinking because what Richard said is like, we have seen those trends due not to digitization, but to other facts and globalization already happening before. I see that unions are struggling of like knowing whom to represent because unions traditionally had been representing those people working in a plant, you know, very clear shifts. And it was a very clear picture of, of like what to protect. But I believe that the democratization or how should I say, is like giving more powers also to those that are the workers is going to be a struggle. Saying that unions could use it, I don't see that they can because they are pretty much like defending their past. And I have always been saying in my former roles, that is also what they are there for, okay? If you go into a union, if you become a member, you want them to protect your job. So I think you always have to see why that is happening. Nevertheless, I think it comes back into not only seeing that one moment, but like looking at the past and looking to the future of like seeing it's like what is the impact and what is going to be the aftermath of like taking some of the decisions. But if we go that far, 
then we also have to think about like, as long as our listed companies and many of the large companies are listed, have to come up with a quarterly result that is always about growth. And those of you investing in results, you want to see your stock price going up. Then of course, it's a little bit more tricky to bring all of the other goals and the purpose targets into the same picture. Yeah. Let me I, just... do think, I do oh. think that unions are rethinking their role. Mm-hmm. Um, if you take a look at what people like Tom Koken at MIT have been thinking about a long time, post-Fordist or post-industrial union organizing, that said, I agree with you, Nina, that, that it is more likely that we need new, new models, additional new models of collective action, not only at the workplace, but in the community level. And one thing I've been right about in, for the past 20 years that, that I think we need more research on and more argumentation and more discourse, discourse on is the fact that in the industrial age, the factory of the corporation was the arena of class struggle. I think you could argue now that the city or the community is the arena of both innovation of productivity increase and of class struggle. So it may be that the new arenas for collective action and bargaining are are not necessarily only factory-based or corporate-based, those are important, but that we have a new moment where collective action at the community level or at the city level, at the metropolitan level becomes more important. I think that's an area where you need, and, and Aisha said something very powerful, governance. I think this question of governance and the scale of governments from the local to the provincial to the national to the global, those are questions that we're only beginning now to think about. And and if the struggle is actually at the city level or the regional level, as you say, and it's not within the walls of the factory, who are you negotiating with? Uh, you're organizing collectively, and I think this is what's so interesting. You're, you're, you're organizing with corporations, you're organizing and, and negotiating with startups, you're organizing and negotiating with city government. The issue with that is then it becomes relatively easy for business owners to say, okay, you've established a progressive beachhead. Let's use the example of San Francisco or Seattle. Yeah. You've established a progressive beachhead in Seattle. You've increased the minimum wage. You've created better rules and regulations. You've established, say, a universal basic income in Finland. And then the business owners say, to hell with you. We're going to move. Yeah, we're just going to move. We're going to move to a less costly, less regulated. And if you don't come in line, we're going to do, I hate to say this, Amazon HQ2. And we're going to create a second headquarters outside of your higher wage, highly regulated, more progressive jurisdiction. I think that's the dilemma of contemporary capitalism. That's what we're up against. Brilliant. We have a couple more minutes and I want to move. There's quite a few questions about green growth. Um, And and, um, I'm going to take one from Alea Yeager. Um, I hope I've um, pronounced that right. How might remote working and the consequent changes to city centres affect those cities' transition to clean energy and infrastructure, especially in lower income countries? Because this is surely an important dimension to this. Aisha, do you have a view? I'm not really uh, an expert on this, but I do think that obviously it makes a difference. And the, I think the more interesting thing from my perspective is when you have remote work, you're using more artificial intelligence, you're using data centers. And data centers themselves are inefficiently using energy and they themselves become a problem as well. So you fix one problem, but you've created another one, which by the way, is always the case with technology, which is why we always have governance in the, in the equation. So basically I think um, the important thing is that there are both algorithmic and other ways in which we can uh, you know, kind of build these data centers, including what Microsoft is looking at having them underwater and their algorithms and ways to cool them. For me personally, that's very interesting. And um, what I would hate to see is that we create a new monster uh, by using this digital work in such a way that actually produces a a problem for cities in terms of sustainability. Um, And I'll just end that I saw this very interesting pilot that's happening in Sweden where they're taking the heat generated from the data centers to actually provide heating to some of the residents in Stockholm. Um, So I thought that was kind of interesting on how to use that energy and not let it go to waste. And that could be another dimension of Richard's community in a way, I suppose. You're just closing the loop. Um, Yanina, do you have any comments on the green pathway? 
No, I mean, it, it, I was just thinking about the scene that Ayesha said. There is another thing, because we spoke about that also in the beginning. If we think about all of the restaurants and cafes that were close to the office buildings, the only way for them in the moment is to survive to go into the delivery. But if you have looked at the numbers of the increase of waste um, due to the yeah. fact that people are ordering food, um, you know, waste of plastic and also paper goes on. I think that is another thing that we created, another burden. Without that, we have resolved the plastic that we see all over the atmosphere and all over the world already. So it's again here is always a balancing that out. And, and I think it's about thinking the entire circle and not like solving a problem or fixing a problem here and then creating another one with the same with the same move. Thanks, Richard. Any thoughts on so this? I think these are. I think inclusivity and resiliency in the green environment are the two big questions moving forward, and will require strategic and intentional action at the global, national, and local scale. I think this is an area where the left just has to do better and make these issues more concrete to people. I mean, what we're dealing with, at least up to now, is that the global right has done a much better job, like it or not, of appealing to the base instinct of people, and we've seen this populist surge. You know, I had to live in the United States, well, Canada, most of, but, but, you know, to see tr what Trump has gone going away, but wreaked havoc on the United States. Look at Boris Johnson and we could go on. The left has to do a much better job of communicating this in a way that, that ties to average people's future, ties to their ability to get a job, get meaningful work, see social mobility for their families, not abstract issues like it, it, I, I come from a working class background. My dad had a seventh grade education. He worked in a factory. They don't understand. They're, they're, it's a, difficult to communicate issues like sea level rise or climate change and the, and the distance of that from this person's life. So I think the progressive left has, it, has an, a big challenge ahead of it to re-engage these issues, critical issues for our future in ways that motivate the working class and the service class and dispossessed and disadvantaged people to raise behind this big challenge. I, you know, these are the things that keep me up at night. Uh, these are the things that really keep me up at night. Well, I'm very glad to know that you're thinking about them. Um, trying, thank trying. You everybody. No, I mean, this has been a really stimulating debate and we've ranged much more widely than I expected actually. Um, and it's almost impossible for me to sum up um, but I guess we started with Richard's reminding us that Zoom is now a noun and a verb, um, which I loved. And actually, you know, as we said, Zoom was around before, but suddenly um, we've accelerated. So we have been through this acceleration. I think all of you uh, feel that. And it sounds like you all think that large cities are going to remain attractive. New York is not dead. Uh, London will continue. And, and we may even be heading into the roaring 2020s, um, but uh, clearly automation is looming and that raises really big questions about not just uh, the kind of work we do, but how we upskill a large proportion of the population to do new jobs, but also I think what you've all talked about is the, be adaptable and, and adaptability and resilience are fundamental, but, but I think so far in our society, we haven't been terribly good at doing that for people and and i think it sounds like we are going to need new forms of support networks new forms of community organizations potentially new roles for government uh, to do that in the future um but lots to think about there um thank you all for a very stimulating debate thanks to the lse and thanks to alfred herhaus and gesellschaft and if you've enjoyed this one please do come to the next urban age debates um, which will include the Mayor of Paris and leaders from Asia, Latin America and American cities. Uh, that's all from me. Um, thank you very much, all of you, for coming along.